or takeaways for the people who couldn't come to the conference. I believe the hashtag is uh, hash so, uh, social logos. I've seen some great tweets. Uh, just please keep that up. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, first I'm going to share some numbers and trends with you. I'm sure this is not new to you, but I, I wanted to, to kick that off and provide some context. Next, I'm going to talk about this new social buyer psychology that's emerging as a result of the new relationship dynamics on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And this is true both of relationships between individuals as well as relationships between businesses and customers. And that's really important. And then last but not least, I'm going to share specifically some of the ways in which social and loco are converging. So um, to begin with, welcome to what I call the Facebook era. I think these graphs, these numbers speak for themselves. I mean, across, around the world, every language, every region, every geography, we're seeing phenomenal adoption of social networking sites. I mean, there's Renrin in China, there's Mixi in Japan, there's Cyworld in South Korea, of course, in large parts of the world, uh, there's Facebook in LinkedIn. Uh, but at the, at the heart of it, again, is a shift away from the World Wide Web of information, which was the first decade of the internet, to the World Wide Web of people. And it's a social graph mapping every single person on the internet and how they're related to each other. Who knows whom and how. So, um, of course, let's take a step back. This isn't the first time we've seen a massive technology disruption completely change the way that we live, work, and communicate. In fact, if you study technology about once a decade, we've seen a completely new technology paradigm emerge that, that provides profound change for business. In the 70s, this was mainframe computing, the idea that we could do these large-scale... social media, and it's about mobile. <clears throat> in 2010, last year, that was the year when social media, at least in the States, became mainstream as a high-priority business objective. <coughs> Nearly three-quarters of chief marketing officers surveyed by Forrester Research said that social media was a top priority for them. Well, this year, this year is all about social media execution. The priority setting from last year has driven the new budgets and the new social media teams for this year. Roles like social media manager, social media director that didn't exist 18 months ago, those are becoming among the fastest growing roles across companies large and small. And so it's an exciting time to be because this is the inflection point for social media, exactly where we were 15 years ago with the web. And so whether you're on the vendor side or on the agency consulting side or at a brand, this is a, a seminal time to be thinking about these technologies and being innovative in how we change and transform our businesses for the better. Okay, so let's talk now about the social buyer psychology. Now, at the heart of this is the social network profile. The thing is, Facebook profiles, LinkedIn profiles, and Twitter profiles have done something very subtle and yet very profound to sociology and to communications. Because what it's done is, on the one hand, it's provided an audience that we trust. Our friends, our family, our colleagues, our, our classmates. And it, combined with that, it's created a template for our online identity. When you sign up for Facebook, you go through a wizard, essentially, and it tells you the kind of information that you are now expected to share. Your name, your photo, where you went to school, what you studied, where you work, uh, what role you, uh, you have, who your friends are, what your favorite books and movies are, all of this information, it's a lot of information, we never shared before in a public way. I mean, you might know someone for months, even years, you don't know their religious views or their political views or what their major was in college. And yet now, all of this information is readily available. Now you combine that with location metadata, and you, you begin to have a really um, accurate and increasingly precise view of who someone is. Now there's a couple implications. 
on a personal level, sociology research, uh, some of it being done at Harvard Business School, is showing us that relationships are accelerating. So sooner after you meet someone, you're deciding whether you want to uh, hire them, work for them, do business with them, date them, because a lot of the information that you previously had to wait until interview number six, or meeting number seven, or date number four to discover, you can discover up front. Now the implication for business is also profound, because what Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn have done is that they've opened up this profile and social uh, activity data for advertisers, such that if you're selling, you know, say, golf clubs, instead of having to advertise to the whole universe of people out there, or instead of having to just be able to capture people at the end of the funnel when they're, they're searching on Google for golf clubs, you can proactively do brand advertising to people who say on their profile that they like to golf. Think about what that does for conversion rate. Well, and it's a good thing, because meanwhile, it's never been harder to acquire a customer. I mean, we've seen email open rates at a historic low. Uh, we've seen you know, just a lot of a general averseness to cold calling and to email marketing campaigns. So how do you reach people? Well, it's through their friends. And you know, the, data, the data supports that increasingly, people are making decisions through their friends. Now, an interesting fact was last year, uh, the amount of referring traffic from Facebook newsfeed for certain media and entertainment sites, for the largest ones, surpassed that of Google search. Now think about that. The way people are discovering information today is changing. Instead of going to search, increasingly, people are relying on their friends. As the amount of data, the amount of information, the amount of products increases, people are kind of pulling back and saying, I want to go through trusted sources. And in general, if you look at the evolution of communication, it's fascinating to see how Facebook messages and LinkedIn messages and tweets are changing that. It's kind of like when we went from in-person meetings to phone calls, and then phone calls to email, and now email to social network interactions or text messages. Each time, the cost of staying in touch went down, and so we stayed in touch with more people. Because you can call far more people in a given day than you could visit in person, and you can email far more people than you could visit or call. And now certainly you can expand a larger network on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter where there's all this ambient intimacy and a way to broadcast instead of specifically selecting people than you ever have before. And again, there's implications for us both personally and professionally. Personally, what we're seeing is that our social networks are growing. People that we never had the capacity to keep in touch with before maybe someone that we used to live with, or someone who we used to go to college with or used to work with, now we have the capacity to keep in touch. And then in general, although it can be a little bit annoying to have someone from grade school friend you on Facebook, that in general, research is showing us that people's social capital is maximizing, is, is increasing as a result of this. Because when you're, in a, when you're in need, in times of need, you have a bigger pool of people to draw on for help. When you're looking for a job, when you're looking to hire, when you're looking for whatever personal or professional task